Welcome to the Leadership Institute's Wednesday Wake Up Club Breakfast Podcast. My name is Eddie Stamper, and I'm the Strategic Marketing Manager here at LI. On the first Wednesday of every month, LI hosts the Wednesday Wake Up Club Breakfast, which gives conservatives an opportunity to come together for good food and conversation with leading speakers on the current events of the day. Former speakers have included members of Congress, public policy experts, and authors. To learn more about the breakfast or to register for the next breakfast, visit leadershipinstitute.org slash breakfast. Also, follow along with the hashtag WWCB on Twitter. This month's speaker was Nick Freitas, a member of the Virginia House of Delegates representing Virginia's 30th District and a candidate for U.S. Senate in 2018. Nick enlisted in the United States Army after high school. Following the tragic events of September 11, 2001, Nick served two combat tours as a Green Beret in the Middle East. Nick is currently serving a second term as a Virginia House of Delegates member, originally elected in 2015. In his time as a delegate, he has defended the rights of everyone from farmers to gun owners to the unborn. Here is Delegate Freitas' speech from the May 2nd Wednesday Wake Up Club Breakfast at the Leadership Institute Stephen P.J. Wood Building in Arlington, Virginia. Well, thank you very much for for having me. I just want to point out real quick that the uh, Leadership Institute was founded in 1979, and I was born in 1979. Coincidence? I'm not sure. But... um, It'd be even better if I could say, and my parents met at a Leadership Institute function, but that that didn't happen, so that'd just be a little bit too good to be true. Um, Well, again, thank you all for having me. I'm a a huge fan of the Leadership Institute and the work that uh, LI has done over the the years. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about about my background, but I I really want to emphasize why why I believe what I believe and, and what I think is kind of the core central holding of uh, conservative philosophy, because I think to some degree that that's been lost. Um, we we probably inherently know it in this room, and and many of us have probably grown up in environments where we talked about it in such a way to where I'm going to what I'm saying right now sounds probably pretty, you know, commonplace. Uh, but the danger is is that we start to assume that well everyone, as Thomas Jefferson would says, holds this, these truths to be self-evident. And I think what we're seeing more and more in American society is that there's a lot of people that don't hold certain truths to be self-evident, and, uh, and I, I think that's, that's, that's concerning. Uh, so it, as was previously mentioned, I, I joined the military right out of high school, uh, enlisted, served in the 82nd Airborne Division, 25th Infantry, and then uh, after 9-11 volunteered and went with uh, Army Special Forces, better known as Green Berets. And I always like to tell everybody, Green Berets specifically deal in counterinsurgency and unconventional warfare, which really prepares you for domestic politics. Um, I, I also got married right out of high school, so it was less than a year out of high school, Tina and I got married, and uh, when, when you get a chance to meet Tina, you'll understand why uh, I had to marry her early. If she had got out of the rather small town that we were in, she would have realized that there was a whole world over there with a, a lot better options than myself, and probably would have made a better decision for her, but uh, I convinced her, and, and we just celebrated 19 years yesterday, so it, I'm, again, very... Uh, not a day goes by that I'm not incredibly thankful that uh, I tricked her into marrying me. Um, we have three children. My oldest daughter, Lily, is 15. My uh, son, Luke, is 12. And then my youngest daughter, Allie, is 10. Um, you know, running for elected office, and, and certainly running for the United States Senate, although I'm not going to really focus on that, but um, that was really never a part of my life plan. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to be in the military. I loved being in the military. I loved being in special forces. Uh, it's a really unique opportunity. It's a unique mission set where you are getting to work by, through, and with local forces in order to try to equip them to be able to better establish security for themselves as opposed to the United States coming in and essentially taking over uh, a theater of operations and then trying to kind of impose a a method as opposed to allowing organic solutions to develop. And so uh, I got to be a a 25-year-old sergeant first class rolling around Iraq with my Iraqi scout platoon. And uh, there was a tremendous amount of of freedom of of movement and operation in that. And I, I loved it. I loved it. Got to go all over the world training everyone from Iraqi scouts to Bangladeshi border guards to Korean special missions group. And it was an incredible experience. Uh, really opened up my eyes to a lot of different things. One of the things that opened up my eyes to is this, the competing philosophy, as I like to call it. And that's the philosophy of control versus the philosophy of individual liberty. And um, I saw what the philosophy of control did to people all over the world. And this philosophy of control, this belief that if you just handed more control, more power, more freedom over to the government and allowed them to uh, essentially micromanage aspects of your lives that I think most of us would find horrifying, uh, they would take care of you. 
And this was always sold to the poorest and the most vulnerable within a society. And a lot of times, it was a, it was a bill of goods sold in a society where there wasn't a lot of freedom anyways. Uh, and, you know, I, I love to quote Bastiat when he says, there's three ways you can organize society, right? The few can plunder the many, the many can plunder the few, or nobody can plunder anybody. And in a lot of these cases where, where socialism started to take hold, you had a society where the few were plundering the many, and it was almost like revenge time. Um, but it never seems to deal, it never seems to deliver on its promises. And it teaches people to believe that the only way that they can get something done or the only way that they can accomplish anything is through the government. And that's a very convenient political philosophy if you're actually in the government. If you're an elected official or if you're a dictator, either way, if you have convinced people to believe that the only way that they can truly affect positive change within their school, within their community, within their environment, within the economy, is by having the better lobbyists or by having the, the right political influence or, or um, you know, spending your time, you know, most of your life focused on government, well, again, that works out well for politicians. Um, it also happens to be a horrible way to solve problems most of the time. You know, contrast that with what I call the philosophy of individual liberty, and that's the belief that people are not just some cog in a government machine, right? They're, they're not, they're not playthings for politicians or some sort of ruling political elite to move around their, their cosmic chessboard uh, in order to reorient society in the way they think it should be run. If you believe in individual liberty, and, and if you believe in liberty in a way that I do, which is, derives from my faith, derives from my Christian faith, that every human being has inherent value and worth. Every human being has a unique purpose that they have to fulfill in this life. God made you free. Government's job is to keep you so. It's not to oppress you. It's not to micromanage you. It's to provide the basic structures necessary to ensure that you're able to pursue happiness in accordance with your definition of it, not the government's. And it, it's based around three core principles. The first one is individual liberty, which is nothing more than you get to live your life the way you want, provided you don't infringe on the right of someone else to do the same. You know, it, it's fascinating to me because I'm constantly running into people that have caricatured Republicans as being mean and intolerant and controlling. And I have to remind some of my liberal friends from time to time, you know, it's funny. I don't require you to solve problems the same way I solve problems. I don't require you to, to fund things that I like. I don't require you to join organizations you don't want to join. But you constantly require me to do that. When I want to solve a problem, I go out and I find other like-minded people that want to pull time, talent, and resources in order to solve a problem. When you want to solve a problem, you set up a government agency, raise my taxes. And then if I don't agree with your particular way of solving a problem, you punish me for it. What about that is tolerant? You know, a, a, good, a good working definition of coexistence is resisting the urge to coerce those whom you can't convince. And yet I'm constantly running into people on the left that, that market themselves as being incredibly tolerant, but by the same token, again, if I don't, if I don't want to fix the problem the same way they want to, I'm an evil person that deserves to have my liberty or my property deprived, taken away from me. And that's why I try to remind them, you know, again, when, when you're talking about solving problems, government is oftentimes the most violent, least creative way to solve things. You know, the, the, second, the second pillar of that, so you have individual liberty, the second pillar is free markets. Because all the marketplace is, is an area where free people get to come together to exchange goods and services, to, to, to use their time, their talents, and their creativity in order to solve problems. And one of the things I always try to remind students when I'm, when I'm talking to high school students or college students is that whenever you're looking at a rule, a regulation, whatever it may be, spend about all of five seconds listening to the intention of the legislator and then five, spend about five hours looking at the uh, incentive structure that will be created. Because the incentive structure is, is what will tell you what will actually happen. The intention might give you a little bit of insight into what they want to achieve. That's useful for maybe getting, some, getting people together to say, okay, if we agree on the end state, what's the best and most effective way to achieve that end state? But the incentive structure is what really tells me what's going to happen. And let's face it, we have a lot of perverse incentives within our government right now, which all have you know, maybe a, a compassionate intention. But if you're insisting that I judge your policy based off of the compassion you felt when you, when you implemented it, 
as opposed to the results it's actually achieved, I'm going to come back and tell you that you might not be as compassionate as you think. Because if every single thing that you do is predicated on this emotional response, and there's nothing wrong with emotion, but emotion is an invitation to thought. And if you're not actually going from the part of emotional reaction to thought and analysis to implementation, if you're cutting out the middleman because you just want to get the headline, that at some point I'm going to question your compassion. And the reason why I, I go through that explanation when I explain the marketplace is because one of the greatest things we have within the free market is the incentive structure. I always like to hold up a smartphone because this is something that pretty much everyone in this room probably has. This is the, the result of the combined action, thoughts, and creativity of thousands of people all over the world because it's not just about the simple construction of the phone, right? If you've never read iPencil, I highly encourage you to do it. I mean, when you read iPencil, you're going to think to yourself, oh my gosh, this is the most arrogant pencil on the planet. Right? But it, it, it really does a great job of explaining all of the different things that had to go into the production of, of a fairly simple item, much less a more complex one like this. The people that put this together, if you got them all in a room, they probably would have different politics, they would have different theologies, they would have different philosophies, they might have a different uh, a preference for economic systems, they would have different tastes in food and dress, cultures may be very, very different, and yet somehow they all were able to collaborate with one another in order to create something that consumers wanted. And the profit that they realize as a result of that is basically us as individuals sending signals that, hey, this, some, this is someone, this is a man or a woman that is really good at using scarce resources in order to better the lives of other people regardless of what their intent was. So that's why government has an obligation to protect the free market. I, I oftentimes hear Republicans talk a lot about being pro-business or pro-small business or pro-this business or pro-that business. I always clarify, I'm pro-free market. Because your success in the marketplace should never be determined based off of your political connections. It should be determined based off of how well do you do, how good a job do you do meeting the needs, wants, and demands of your fellow citizens, and you do such a good job of it that they're willing to voluntarily engage in that transaction to mutual benefit as opposed to the government coming in and coercing the decisions. That's why the free market is so, is so important. Because let's face it, without free markets and without property rights, all right, voting rights are nothing more than ritualistic selections of who gets to take your stuff. All right? They had elections in Iraq. Saddam won, 98%. That is quite a get-out-the-vote effort. Right? <laughs> All right, but if you don't have the free market to correspond with the voting rights, if you don't have the property rights to correspond with the voting rights, you're not truly free. You're not truly free. And the third pillar is equal justice before the law. You know, I, I, I hear all the time, again, from some of my liberal-leaning friends, they like to talk about social justice. And it seems to be this empty bucket that you can put anything into. Uh, Walter Williams, I think, once had a, an interesting quote on social justice. He goes, here's my definition. I keep what I earn, you keep what you earn. If you disagree with me, tell me how much of what, what I earn belongs to you and why. Right? Social justice cannot, if, if your definition of social justice is equality of outcomes, you're going to come up with a really, really oppressive society in order to achieve that. I see justice as when you show up to a court of law in this country, well, first of all, the laws are there to protect your liberty and protect your property rights. But then when you show up to a court of law, I don't care how much money you have. I don't care who your parents were. I don't care about your political connections. You are to be judged equally in that court. And again, it, it derives from my faith, right? God sees us as equal. So too should our court system. And when we create laws and when we create environments where we come up with all this, this stratification of society where we're going to recognize one group as being more important than another group, one person as being more important than another group, we are denying somebody else justice as a result. So those three things. It's fairly simple. Individual liberty, free markets, equal justice before the law. When, I, when we talk about those things, what we find, if, in fact, if you take... Uh, Republican or you take whatever political party out you want out of it and you just mention those philosophical standpoints, you'll find that there's a lot of agreement among Americans. But I want to go to, to one other point. Why do we believe those things? Right? Because I, for me, it's not just a utilitarian conviction. Right? I, I don't just believe in free markets because it produces better economic outcomes. 
I don't believe in, in individual liberty because it produces better social outcomes. Those are byproducts of why I believe those things, and those certainly are contributing factors, but ultimately, I believe in those things because of how I see people. I love the individual. I love people. Societies, communities, it, it's just a grouping of, of individuals. And it is amazing to me. It is absolutely amazing to me that to have a philosophy that is rooted in that and, and, and certainly to make every effort to not only vote that way and legislate that way, but live that way. To see people that believe as we do caricatured as being evil, bigoted, racist, homophobic, xenophobic, you name it. And to see that constantly repeated and reinforced within popular culture. Whether it's movies, academia, the media, music. You know, I, my wife and I, when we do get time to, to watch a show or whatnot, you know, we like some of these crime series and whatnot. And it's amazing to me that if, if you're watching a crime series, Okay, and the detective comes in and they're looking for the perpetrator and they don't know, gosh, who, who could this horrible murdering ser serial killer be? And, and one detective looks at, well, have you, have you investigated Hank Johnson? Hank Johnson, the guy involved in right-wing politics? I know who the serial killer is, right? Because, once again, we're reinforcing this narrative that if you, if you hold to these beliefs, if you hold to conservative politics, then you only do so because you've probably lived a privileged lifestyle and you're just trying to protect your little fiefdom and you don't care about anybody else. But how can that be true? When I, I know from my own personal experience and I, and I know from, from interacting with other conservatives and when you look at the statistics with respect to who actually gives to charitable institutions, and I don't, just, I don't mean just charity like the ballet, right? Nothing wrong with that, that's wonderful. But I mean actual charities that are feeding hungry people that are helping sick people, you're going to find that the largest percentage comes from conservatives. Because we don't believe that we have the authority or the right to delegate our responsibility to help our neighbor to a government entity. We're neither convinced that they do a good job of it, nor are we convinced that they have the, the moral right to compel someone else to do something or try to fix a problem the way we might want to fix it. So I, I think one of the things that we have to do as people within the conservative movement is we have to once again get back to the core fundamentals and explaining why we believe what we do. And, I, and I'll just relay a, I'll relay a quick story and then I'll uh, be happy to take questions. Um, I was working in the office, at Republican, or I was working on 2016 elections with my wife, a Republican office, and a woman walks in, um, probably in her uh, mid-60s, and she's holding a a piece of direct mail, and she goes, how do I keep this hate mail from coming to my house? And I'm like, what, what hate mail is this? Well, it's from Mitt Romney. <laughs> it, it's hate mail from Mitt Romney, really? I didn't know he had it in him. <laughs> it's, um, and, and so we're, we're talking, I'm like, well, what, what exactly do you find hateful about this? Well, it's just, it's just hateful, this idea that you don't care about the sick, and you don't care about the poor. I'm like, Wow, I had no idea I was such a horrible human being. And so we start to talk. Because the assumption walking in was, right, I'm a Republican, so I must be either evil or ignorant, and probably both. Right, so the first thing I had to overcome was evil, right? I'm, I'm not evil. So we start to talk about our, our own experiences, our own lives and growing up. And, and look, I, I, think I, had a, I think I had a great childhood. I mean, according to the Democrats, I fit into several different victim groups, right? You know, broken home, you know. The, but I, I, you know, again, I, I was brought up with, with parents that, you know, taught me the, the value of being able to overcome circumstances. And so she starts to, to learn my story as we start to talk. And I, I tell her about how my, my very conservative mother took me all over the world on mission trips you know, attempting to help people, and, and not just meeting spiritual needs, but meeting physical needs as well. And then talking about raising my own kids, and talking about my experience in Iraq, and taking a great deal of pride in the fact that when a U.S. service member walks into a, a village over there, and they see that American flag, kids feel safe to come out. All of a sudden, I wasn't evil anymore. Right? That narrative didn't work. The caricature didn't work. So clearly... I must have been ignorant, right? So she's, she's willing to see the ground. Okay, Nick, you're not an evil guy. You must be an ignorant guy. 
And so we, we start to go through, and I, I say, look, you know, I, I understand that, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a little bit younger. I think it was about 32, 33 at the time. I can't remember. Not that great at math. Anyway, <laughs> most politicians aren't. Just look at our budgeting. Anyway, um, and I, I said, well, here's my experience. You know, I, I know what it's like to grow up in a broken home. I know what it's like to live in, gosh, five different states because I was in the military. I lived all over the place. I know what it's like to own a home. I know what it's like for my family to lose a home. My wife knows what it's like to get flooded twice and lose absolutely everything and have to rebuild. Tina and I know what it's like being married as an E2 in the Army when you're making nothing and the power gets shut off. Uh, we know what it's like to raise kids. We know what it's like to be at war. You know, at, at what point have I met the threshold for having enough real-world life experience to hold my opinions and have them be respected? And then finally, we, we go to the other. So that's general ignorance, right? But I forgot. There's another form of it. I was just ignorant of her philosophy. So now we've achieved. I'm not, I'm not an evil guy anymore. I'm not an ignorant guy, at least in the general sense. But clearly, I don't understand her philosophy. And if I did, then I would be signing up on board to you know, be a liberal progressive. I said, OK, well, let's, let's try one other thing. For the next five minutes, I will argue in favor of liberal progressivism in a way that you will find convincing. And all I ask is that as soon as I'm done, you argue for conservatism in a way that I will find convincing. And she goes, I don't think I would know how to do that. I said, well, then if we're being intellectually honest, what do we conclude? And she goes, I'd vote for you. <laughs> Now, now, again, I didn't, I didn't do anything, you know, especially special or mind-boggling here. The, the problem was is that as we become more bifurcated within society and as we all retreat to our little enclaves, we forget that the most important thing that we can do in order to spread the conservative's message is actually live it in a way that is effective and that people can see. Because I will tell you right now, the number one way to destroy that caricature is not by having a great argument about the Austrian theory of the business cycle. Don't get me wrong. I am down with that argument, and we can do that for the next hour if you like, because I think it's great. The way that you defeat that caricature is you actually confront people with the truth. They've been fed a counterfeit version of us. You don't beat the counterfeit by railing against the counterfeit. You beat the counterfeit by showing people the genuine article. And I'm willing to bet that if we went around this room right now and we actually looked at personal experiences and challenges that you've overcome, what we would all realize is that there's a lot of people in here that have lived some incredibly fascinating lives, that have overcome challenges that are just incredible. But that's not the caricature that's being sold about you. So I would just encourage everyone that one of the most important things that they do here at the Leadership Institute is actually teaching you how to, again, we don't have a principles problem. We have a messaging problem. We have a community problem. Taking this out and applying what, what you learn, not just in the political arena. You know, I, I was speaking at my church a while back, and I'll, I'll, I'll end with this. I was speaking at my church a while back, and uh, my pastor asked me, he's like, Nick, we're going to do a segment on God and government. Would you like to come in and share the stage with me? I'm like, oh, great. You get to represent God, and I get to represent Caesar. Yeah. Um, and as we were talking about various things, I, I said, you know, one of the biggest problems that we have in this country is that we, even within Christianity, and again, I don't mean to exclude anyone of a, of a different faith, but we have this belief now that we're going to solve everything through politics. That is what got us into this mess. When, when the moment churches and families and communities started to cede certain inherent responsibilities that they had for the raising and education of children, for providing for a neighbor in need, as soon as we started to cede that over to the government, what, what did we think was going to happen? One thing I know about one thing I know about politics in general is that. You give someone enough power, they have an insatiable lust for more of it. Unless they are grounded and rooted in a philosophy which, which really causes them to understand that their goal there is not to accumulate power or to order society the way they think it should be. It's only to have enough power to ensure that people can live free. And how much in the church have we rendered to Caesar? My goal as a devout Christian is not to get into government power so I can impose Christianity. My faith provides me no such authority to do so. And as conservatives, we also have to understand that, again, our, our goal 
for, for getting into positions of influence within government is not to impose certain decisions that we would like other people to make. Your ability to leave, live free means that you have the ability to make decisions that I would, never disagree, I would never agree with, that I might even think are destructive. All I ask is that you allow me to make my own decisions and that neither one of us be coerced to pay the price for somebody else's mistakes or decisions. Because every time government does try to step in and say, oh, no, no, we're just going to help when somebody falls down, we're going to lift them up. To some degree, they are depriving that person of the knowledge and the education that takes place from learning from a bad decision. And if the only way that you're going to subsidize the bad decision is by punishing somebody that's made good decisions, what sort of incentive structure are you creating? Because believe me, I know what it is to need help from somebody. I know what it is to finally be at that point where I can't, I need help. But here's what I found is that when it came from my family or when it came from a friend or when it came from someone at church, I felt gratitude. I felt the need to reciprocate. I didn't feel isolated from my community. I felt a part of it. When government tries to supplant that and come in and replace the mother and the father, replace the church, replace the civic group, it creates a feeling of entitlement and dependency and isolation. So if, if there's one thing I could leave you with is that the way that we're going to win, because it's not just about winning elections. I don't want to just win elections. I want to win the culture. I'll know we've won when everybody running for office is running on the idea of individual liberty, free markets, and equal justice before the law. But if we're going to do that, we can't just vote that way. We have to live that way. So that now when, when somebody gets up there and says, you know what, the government should not be micromanaging the health industry from Washington, D.C. I never want to hear, well, then who would do it? I want people to automatically know, oh, no, I completely agree. Why would I ever go to the government? Why would I ever take that problem and put it in the hands of a room full of politicians and bureaucrats? No, if I need assistance, I'm going to go to my family. I'm going to go to my church. I'm going to go to the Rotary. I'm going to go to that civic organization where people have teamed together to work together in voluntary cooperation, not under the threat of force and coercion. So thank you again for being here. Thank you for everything that you guys do in order to, again, not only affect the political world, but to affect the communities that you live in, to raise your families. I'm telling you, that is what is going to carry the day, and it's ultimately what's going to save this country and renew the promise of what it is to be an American. So thank you very much, and I'll be happy to take questions.